St. Lawrence Hall on King Street at Jarvis. Some 200 years ago, this hall was part of Market Square, the heart of Toronto. In 1851, one of the most significant events in the lives of the early African Canadian residents of Toronto occurred here. 53 delegates from all over North America and the West Indies attended the very first North American Convention for Colored People held here in this very room. So there had to be something good happening in Toronto. It wasn't perfect, but it was something good. So good, in fact, that in 1851, people of African origin from all over the diaspora, when congregating in this building, decided that Canada was the best place in the world to emigrate to. In attendance were prominent black figures like Henry Bibb, publisher of The Voice of the Fugitive, a major black newspaper at the time, he organized and chaired the conference. Mary Ann Shad, publisher of the Provincial Freeman, another major black newspaper. Thornton Blackburn, owner of Toronto's first taxi service. Dr. Wilson Ruffin Abbott, a University of Toronto graduate and the first Canadian-born black physician. William Still of Philadelphia, author and abolitionist. Reverend William Mitchell, author, missionary and community activist. They met for three days here and talked about everything that concerned black people. But a main item on the agenda was um, immigration. Where is the safest place for Africans in North America? The delegates here came to the conclusion that Canada was the best place for, for black people on, on the North American continent with Jamaica coming, running a close second. Both Canada and Jamaica were part of the British Empire where slavery had been abolished in 1834. But slavery was still legal in the United States and was the backbone of the American economy, enriching Europeans at the expense of the Africans, especially in the South. The conference ended with a call to African Americans to flee to Canada for freedom and opportunity. Many heeded the call, taking the Underground Railroad to Canadian destinations like Toronto. It was a growing city and it was a fantastic place for people to come to because they had the strong support of the primarily white abolitionist community. At the City of Toronto Archives on Spadina Road, an original letter to the Mayor of Toronto in 1841 signed by 33 black residents, many of them wealthy businessmen, protesting a minstrel show coming to the city. Mm -hmm. That's right, and the way they and, were portrayed. And these are the undersigned. These are all black residents of the city in yes. 1841. It is tremendously important to realize that an awful lot of people who came here had some, they had education, they had money. You were a direct descendant of Barry Ann Shad, who was the first publisher, woman publisher, of any newspaper in North America. First black woman newspaper publisher and editor, yes. Um, I descend from one of her brothers, actually. Adrian Shad. If for Cooper and Carolyn Smiles Frost have researched the lives of the early Africans in Toronto and written a book about them. The Underground Railroad, next stop Toronto. A video presentation that's been on display at the Royal Ontario Museum for the past year is based on their research. People come away incredibly moved. Uh, you'll see people gathering tears from their eyes when they come out of it because it, it's really brought the story to life. This it was excellent, thing. very informational. Yeah. These are the three ladies that did all the research that did the really? show was based it was on. Awesome. It was wonderful, it really was. Great We have the first recorded presence of African people in, in the city, in Toronto, then called York, in 1793, when Simcoe came to York. John Graves Simcoe, the British governor of Upper Canada, found a sheltered harbor near a trading post the Aboriginal people called Toronto, ideal for military defense and to settle British soldiers and supporters 
after the British were defeated in the American Revolutionary War. He changed the name from Toronto to York and built a military garrison near the harbor. Simcoe, an abolitionist, also restricted slavery in his territory with the legislation freeing all slaves when they reached the age of 25. We're in the Baldwin room at the Toronto Reference Library, and this is where we did a lot of the research for the ROM show. Mm -hmm. Toronto was one of the places that people settled along the eastern, coming along the eastern seaboard from mm -hmm. Philadelphia through New York State. The research revealed by the end of the 18th century, 150 settlers had moved into York, joining the Aboriginal people already here. 25 of the new settlers were of African origin. Some of the best information I found in this book is The Town of York by Edith G. First. In 1799, there were 15 Negroes in York and another 10 in Peter Long's household east of the Don. And he was a, a black loyalist, a free man. He had a farm in the Don Valley and he had 10 people in his household. With relationship to the black loyalist story, it began in 1783. They traveled as part of the fleets that left New York City after the evacuation uh, by the British from the American Revolutionary War. What's unique about this is that the United Empire loyalists, who were, of course, of European descent, had enslaved individuals with them. And along with that, there were free black men and women and children who were served the British war effort. And they were independently given land grants and a status of freedom. Jarvis, William Jarvis, who became the secretary of, of, um, of, of the province, of the legislature, we know that he had slaves in his household from his personal papers. So did Peter Russell, the provincial administrator. He had six slaves in his household. Okay, Jojo, so these boxes are from the Russell Papers. So look at this one. It's very, very old, June 1796. This is over 200 years old. He put an ad in the York Gazette. That's the newspaper of Toronto at that time. So it says here, to be sold, a black slave woman named Peggy, aged about 40 years, and a black slave boy, her son, named Jupiter, aged about 15 years, both of them the property of the subscriber. They are each of them servants for life. That means slaves. Slave, it's a euphemism yeah. for yeah, slaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The price for the woman is $150, for the boy $200, payable in three years. F. For Cooper and her co-authors also discovered a group of black men built the first road in the new town of York. Here we have, again, in 1799, blacks um, cooperated with each other, black men, united to contract for the building of a road from Davenport Road to Castle Frank Road. We know that Africans were the people who helped to build the first parliament buildings on the site on Parliament Street. They had many types of trades and skills, which meant that they were employable. As Toronto's population grew, so did the numbers of its black residents. By 1834, when slavery was finally abolished throughout the British Empire, there were 400 people of African origin living here. The number grew to 1,600 by 1850. Most were fugitive slaves, but there were also free blacks, among them professionals, skilled tradesmen, laborers, and those who had owned their own businesses south of the border, but didn't feel safe because slavery was still legal. Gordon Blackburn, fugitive slave, entrepreneur, humanist, and community activist, rests here at Necropolis Cemetery in Cabbage Town. His wife Lucy, his mother, and many of Toronto's early pioneers of African origin are buried here with him. You see when he's listed in the Toronto Street Directories in the 1860s, just after he's retired, he's called Thornton Blackburn Gentleman. Is that right? He's huh? living off the proceeds of his savings for them. So he made a lot of money with a taxi company? He did. Thornton Blackburn and his wife Lucy arrived in Toronto in 1834, the year slavery was abolished in Canada and throughout the British Empire. And after waiting on tables here at Osgood Hall for a few years, Blackburn started a horse and buggy taxi service. 
but first in Toronto. Horton had someone send to Montreal for him and get the design of the first hackney cab built in Upper Canada, and he ran the first taxi business, not only in Toronto, but in all of Upper Canada, what is now Ontario. Archaeologist and historian Carolyn Smart Frost has spent 17 years researching the story of Toronto's early residents of African origin, especially Thornton Blackburn. He was born in Maysville, Kentucky, but the first time I find him in the records, he was owned by a man by the name of Dr. Gideon Brown. His owner died in there, and, the, and Susan Brown, the widow, took him to Louisville and hired him out to a general store, and he worked as a porter there, and she took all of his salary. He ran away from there, from Louisville. He had met Lucy, or Ruthie, and as she was called in slavery, and the two of them ran away on July 3rd, 1831. And they lived in Detroit for two years. And they were captured in Detroit. And, and, and imprisoned. And imprisoned. The owners of Thornton and Lucy sent lawyers to Michigan to reclaim their property. They were going to be sent back. And the story is amazing. How did they get away? The local black community planned a riot. The night before, the, before they were going to be taken steamboat, two of the church ladies, Mrs. Lightfoot and Mrs. French, went into the jail to visit with Lucy Blackburn and one of them changed clothes with her, with her and stayed behind in her stead and Lucy walked out of the jail and they got her across the river to Canada and nobody caught this till the next morning. How did Thornton get away? Thornton was brought to the door of the jail, manacles on his hands, manacles on his feet and up the main street of Detroit towards the jail marched a crowd of 200 African Americans some of them from Detroit, some of them from the rest of Michigan, and a whole bunch from Fort Malden, Ontario. And he and six young men got into a boat and they came across to Canada where they were thrown into jail. Because the mayor of Detroit sent a note and said, hey, we have a runaway slave, he created a riot, his wife's over there to capture them. Lieutenant Governor Sir John Colburn was an ardent abolitionist. He hated slavery and he was not going to send them back. He just had to find a legal way not to do it. Well, inciting a riot was a capital crime, so that's what they were accused of. And the governor of Michigan sent two sets of extradition documents. And basically what Upper Canada said was, Mrs. Blackburn was in Canada when the riot, the riot blew, uh, flared up. There's no way she was involved. And we don't really see how Thornton Blackburn could have been involved in a riot, but he was inside the jail, the jail yeah. during. Right? Mm -hmm. So they were freed. And, and Sir John Colburn said, let them go. Let them go. And they came to Toronto and they started a new life. The Blackburns settled on Eastern Avenue, where they lived until Thornton passed on in 1890. He arrived in the city 1834. Yes. yes. And he settled here. He settled right here. Records show Thornton Blackburn was one of the delegates from Canada West, Ontario, at the first convention for colored people here at St. Lawrence Hall in September 1851. He left the convention being one of the participants in an organization that was developed as a result of the resolution passed at the convention. And that was an organization called the Canadian Mill and Mercantile Association. And that company was established by black businessmen from Buffalo and Toronto to provide funding to build a mill, a grist mill, a, a sawmill, and a general store at the, the fugitive slave colony at Buxton to provide employment for fugitive slaves who came into the country. They were, they were generous, but they were also involved. They participated in the political protest against slavery and against racial oppression in very significant ways. They made a difference in their, in their world. She died at 111 years old. She was the oldest resident of Seton Village, which is what this became. Deborah Brown was another fugitive slave who settled in Toronto in the mid-19th century with her husband, Perry. He was listed as a laborer, and um, we know that she was a washerwoman. There were a few years in the uh, 1870s when she was listed in the city directory as a nurse. The ageless Deborah Brown was featured in this historical article in the old Toronto Evening Telegram, published by John Ross Robinson. They were calling her Mammy Brown. According to the article, she lived in the oldest house in Seton Village, and we have a drawing of her house at 691 Markham. 
This was the heart of Seton Village, Blue and Bathurst. It was Deborah and Perry Brown's neighborhood. Originally from Maryland, Deborah and Perry settled here on Markham Street. Uh, originally, a lot of this land was um, donated to um, British soldiers and um, the upper class families. Eventually, they would sell off parcels of land to you know, incoming settlers. Um, and that's how she ended up here. She got an, a quarter acre parcel of land. They settled on it first. And then in 1870, they bought the land and uh, the little house that they lived in. She came somewhere in the mid 19th century. Um, and of course, she, um, she and her husband, Perry, were escaped slaves. Um, apparently, they learned that he was going to be sold. And so they just dropped everything and, and ran. Although this area had many British settlers, it also attracted African Americans. Many were Deborah and Perry Brown's neighbors. Among them, prominent businessman Richard D. Richards and Reverend William Mitchell, who documented the lives of early black settlers in this book, The Underground Railroad. He describes Toronto. He also ta described um, Richard B. Richards' uh, ice business and described uh, how successful his business was. Well, he just sold ice blocks. He sold ice, yeah. The black community had grown to a few thousand, with the majority living in what we now call downtown. In, in the middle decades of the 19th century, this was indeed the heart of the black community. Mm -hmm. The city hall, the Sheridan Hotel, the Oscar Hall, just north of here, was all the black neighborhoods. Yes, yeah. definitely. There's this whole mythology about the Underground Railroad that everybody who came here was a poor, downtrodden, fugitive slave from a plantation with just wearing the shirt on their back. Well, Wilson Roof and Abbott, right here, eventually became the richest African Canadian living in Upper Canada or in Canada West. He owned land, I think he had 46 properties ranging from Toronto right up to Owen Sound, um, and was involved in all the major protests. His son, was the first Canadian-born black doctor to graduate from King's College Medical School. They came to Canada so they could get their children educated. Toronto never had segregated education, and it never had segregated churches. So Toronto was way ahead of its time. It was quite a liberal city. Yeah, Toronto's yeah. unusual. Yeah. Toronto's unusual. And it still attracts people like that, who basically want to find freedom, a yes. place to kind of call home and do mm -hmm. what they can do somewhere else. Yeah, it's really quite wonderful. famous fugitive extradition case happened here at Osgood Hall in 1861, the John Anderson trial. The case became a very important symbol for those who were fighting the evils of slavery and the slave trade. At the center of the historic case was fugitive slave Jack Burton, who changed his name to John Anderson while on the run. In 1853, John Anderson escaped from the slave state of Missouri, leaving behind a wife and child. His plan was to come to Canada where slavery was illegal and send for his family. But while escaping, he killed a white man. Anyway, he lived here until he was discovered. In 1860, seven years after his escape, John Anderson was arrested, tried in Brantford, and ordered return to Missouri, a state known for lynching blacks. Going back meant certain death. If John Anderson was sent back, Canada would no longer be a haven for African-American fugitive people. Anderson's lawyers appealed the decision. December 15, 1860, John Anderson stood in this courtroom, the court of the Queen's Bench, Ontario's highest court. The Americans wanted him back to face murder charges, but the Canadian courts had to decide whether or not to extradite a fugitive slave. Presiding judges were Chief Justice Sir John Beverly Robinson, Justices Archibald McLean, and Robert Easton Burns. The Anderson case galvanized black communities across southern Ontario, especially in Simcoe and Brant counties, where he lived, and Toronto. The decision of the Queen's Bench, two to one, to return John Anderson back to Missouri. Chief Justice Robinson and Justice Burns ruled in favor of extradition 
John Beverly Robinson, who was the Chief Justice of the province, headed the, headed the Queen's Bench Court, and Robinson ruled that Anderson be extradited. Now that was a tragic, that was quite tragic. And I think it helped rouse the abolitionists. Justice McLean, an abolitionist, dissented. Historian Ifo Cooper has summed up McLean's reasons in an essay on the Anderson case. Quote, slavery was against natural laws. It was therefore wrong. Anderson was acting in defense of his natural rights. Missouri laws passed by the strong to oppress the weak were tyrannical. The laws of a slave state should never be considered when deciding upon a matter of extradition for a fugitive slave. McLean concluded the prisoners now entitled to be discharged from custody. But the majority decision by Chief Justice Robinson and Justice Burns meant John Anderson was going to be sent back to Missouri. The black and the abolitionist communities came out here right on, at Osgood Hall on these grounds and determined that that was not going to happen. Support for Anderson grew with several Canadian newspapers condemning the decision, calling it mean-spirited. The Toronto Globe wrote, if Sir John B. Robinson's judgment be correct, no slave is safe in Canada. The Quebec Mercury. The judgment of the court in Anderson's case is one of those infamous prostitutions of judicial power. Montreal Witness. Such a gigantic wrong cannot exist on the same continent with us without affecting the people of Canada in one way or another. And the fact that Canadians rallied around John Anderson to the extent that he did, uh, I think certainly is a very positive chapter in our history. But in 1860, Britain had the final word. Demonstrations and protests followed, both here in Toronto and in Britain. Eventually, Britain, Canada's colonial ruler, got involved. Anderson got a new trial. In a decision written by Justice Henry Draper, John Anderson was freed on a technicality. Fortunately, the matter was eventually resolved in his favor and he never went back to Missouri, where he would undoubtedly, as you say, have been uh, murdered. All this happened on the eve of the Civil War, which led to the abolition of slavery in the United States. Now, as for John Anderson, he never felt safe here, being so close to the United States. So he moved to Britain and eventually settled in Liberia, West Africa. I'm Jacob Chinchoff, City Pulse.